Festival di Limes. Oggi cominciamo la nostra giornata, come vedete dal titolo di questo nostro panel, in modo apparentemente diverso dai temi che trattiamo normalmente a Limes, ma allo stesso tempo centrato sul festival che si intitola Una strategia per l'Italia. Questa mattina proveremo a capire come si fa strategia in generale, ma poi come si fa strategia applicandola a, ad alcune delle principali potenze del pianeta. Sono Dario Fabio, sono consigliere scientifico di Limes e questa mattina introdurrò il panel e l'idea eh, di strategia e di tattica applicandola ad alcuni casi concreti, in particolare alla Germania e all'Italia, per poi lasciare la parola agli ustri ospiti che vedete ai miei, al, al mio fianco. Eh, Jacob Shapiro l'avete già incontrato ieri, capo analista di Macrogeo un magazine che si occupa di geopolitica e tra, il, tra i principali, sicuramente tra i più prestigiosi degli Stati Uniti, quindi Dimitri Suslov che vedete invece alla mia destra e anche ieri ha partecipato al primo panel della giornata che è vice direttore del Dipartimento per gli Studi Europei eh, dell'Iowa School of, e of Economics di Mosca e eh, al mio fianco invece Abdul Sarul Dipsalar che è analista presso l'Istituto for Middle East Strategic Studies di eh, Teheran. Cominciamo, dicevo, provando a spiegare qual è la differenza, anzitutto tra due termini che spesso si usano in forma interscambiabile, cioè strategia e tattica. Abbiamo la vaga percezione che strategia e tattica siano di fatto dei, dei sinonimi, che si possano usare in forma interscambiabile, quasi fossero la stessa identica cosa. Noi stessi nel titolo del festival e nel titolo del numero abbiamo eh, parlato, abbiamo scritto di una strategia per l'Italia, di fatto mettendo insieme due concetti, per semplificare ovviamente, eh, che possono essere contenuti nel termine st strategia ma che non sono identici, appunto quello, eh, quelli di strategia e tattica. Di che cosa stiamo parlando? La strategia di per sé rappresenta ciò che necessariamente una potenza deve eh, realizzare e che invece eh, ha già di per sé nel suo DNA. Si tratta dei bisogni fondamentali di una potenza, si tratta delle necessità assolute eh, legate al suo stare al mondo, eh, quindi quanto deve perseguire per rimanere nel pianeta e soprattutto non collassare sotto la spinta di attori stranieri o semplicemente sotto il peso delle sue incongruenze eh, strutturali. Per capirci si tratta delle necessità e degli obiettivi primari di qualsiasi soggetto geopolitico. Se volessimo rappresentarla su un piano geometrico è come se da un punto A dovessimo andare necessariamente, qui la verba è fondamentale, al punto B senza possibilità di scelta. Il che significa che fare strategia nel senso più puro non vuol dire inventare la strategia. Spesso si discute di strategia in forma teoretica come se la strategia fosse semplicemente qualcosa legato alla speculazione, più o meno filosofica, ovvero mettersi davanti a un foglio di carta e disegnarla inventandola. La strategia nella forma più pura dovrebbe esistere di per sé, almeno come sostrato, e il compito dello stratega dovrebbe essere quello di riconoscerla più che di inventarla, perché se è legata ai bisogni fondamentali di un soggetto geopolitico e collegata alle caratteristiche di questo soggetto, quindi alle caratteristiche storiche, antropologiche, demografiche, economiche di un soggetto, uno stratega capace deve essere in grado semplicemente di riconoscere quali sono i bisogni fondamentali della collettività, non inventarli. Esistono già di per sé, anzi a volte, nella tentativo di inventarli, cioè di immaginarli semplicemente in forma arbitraria, si rischia di compiere un grave errore e soprattutto di realizzare un grave danno, perché il corollario diretto legato al fare strategia è che sbagliare strategia comporta o può comportare la fine di una collettività geopolitica, letteralmente la sua estinzione. Quando non riesce a perseguire i bisogni fondamentali, gli obiettivi fondamentali della sua esistenza può letteralmente scomparire, almeno nella sua forma sovrana, cioè può diventare provincia di un impero altrui, può diventare parte di una sfera di influenza altrui, peraltro processo normalissimo nelle relazioni internazionali, niente di straordinario, ma è evidente che cogliere la strategia senza immaginarla ma riconoscerla è il primo 
processo che chi si occupa di, di geopolitica deve saper realizzare. Da questa parte necessaria e allo stesso tempo complicatissima, perché riconoscere la strategia, anche se esistente nelle sue forme delineate, eh, nel suo aspetto più o meno primordiale, è comunque un esercizio molto complicato. Non è semplicissimo, non basta guardare dalla finestra per capire, ad esempio, ne discuteremo in questo mio breve intervento, qual è la strategia dell'Italia, ad esempio. Già questo è un esercizio tremendamente complesso, che però dovrebbe riguardare il mestiere di uno stratega. A fianco alla strategia, come sua diretta conseguenza, vi è la tattica, che non è, come detto, un sinonimo, spesso anche in senso giornalistico, i due termini vengono utilizzati, dicevo, in forma interscambiabile, sarà capitato o vi capiterà di leggere una pubblicistica sterminata in cui si scrive e si legge di errore strategico ed errore tattico quasi fossero la stessa cosa o di più eh, si scrive di strategia in maniera molto disinvolta, molto sportiva, cioè eh, bisogna immaginare una nuova strategia quando in realtà, come detto, la strategia non si può immaginare ex novo di per sé, dovrebbe essere riconosciuta e poi adattata al tempo in cui si vive. Ed è questo il passaggio che conduce alla tattica. La tattica è certamente una fase maggiormente arbitraria a disposizione di chi si occupa di geopolitica piuttosto che di questioni militari, eccetera, eccetera, ma si può applicare a qualsiasi campo. Esiste ovviamente una strategia economica, come esiste una tattica economica e così via. Che cos'è la tattica? È la declinazione della strategia. Presi gli elementi fissi che esistono, che riguardano una collettività, come ha detto la sua storia, la sua collocazione nel pianeta, essere una potenza marittima o vivere in un territorio che non ha uno sbocco al mare, cambia inevitabilmente la strategia. Eh, se l'Italia volesse avere la strategia della Svizzera, così semplicemente perché qualcuno si divertisse ad inventarla e a modellarla su quella Svizzera, non potrebbe farlo semplicemente. La dimensione demografica dell'Italia, il suo sviluppo civile, la sua collocazione geografica, la sua storia, le sue caratteristiche economiche sono molto diverse. Però la tattica ci consente di declinare queste caratteristiche che, come detto, pertengono alla strategia nel momento stesso in cui il eh, Paese, il soggetto geopolitico di cui trattiamo, o non soltanto il soggetto geopolitico, si inserisce nel contesto reale. Quindi le sue relazioni con le altre potenze, il momento specifico che vive, l'idea che ha di sé la popolazione in una specifica fase storica, la disponibilità economica, finanziaria, le capacità della collettività la voglia di fare la guerra, la voglia che hanno di fare la guerra contro di noi i nostri vicini o i nostri anche lontani, per usare questa espressione. Quindi la, la, la tattica agisce come declinazione della strategia e può mutare molto spesso. Se come detto sul piano geometrico la strategia è andare necessariamente dal punto A al punto B, la tattica sono eh, i punti, i molteplici punti che possiamo attraversare per arrivare al punto B, perché noi possiamo andare dal punto A al punto B soltanto su una linea retta, possiamo andarci in modo obliquo piuttosto che curvando, tornando avanti e indietro, ma passando per il punto C, E, F fino a Z e anche oltre. Molto dipende da che cosa abbiamo in testa e, come detto, dalle risorse a disposizione nel momento specifico e forse ancora più importante dall'atteggiamento che hanno gli altri attori con i quali ci confrontiamo in uno specifico, in uno specifico frangente. Ed è qualcosa che non possiamo dimenticare che già quindi ci pone in una fase di grande differenza tra chi fa lo stratega, spesso in Italia raramente qualcuno fa lo stratega, ancora meno il tattico, il tattico in Italia si sente soprattutto per la vela, chi, qualcuno che segue la vela incontra sempre, quasi sempre un tattico, in geopolitica quasi mai, ma la differenza fra uno stratega e un tattico è essenzialmente quella legata ad una libertà di immaginazione che è molto diversa, cioè lo stratega deve essere in grado di riconoscere ciò che vede con gli occhi ed avere una straordinaria conoscenza della storia e della geografia del soggetto di cui si occupa. Eh, anche una straordinaria sensibilità nel riconoscere questi elementi. E deve essere una persona che ha conoscenza di più di quanto non conosca un tattico, non perché quello del tattico sia necessariamente un difetto. Il tattico, se possibile, non deve essere a conoscenza di tutti i problemi pena l'immobilità della tattica. È evidente che maggiormente conosciamo le costrizioni verso le quali ci poniamo, maggiormente diventiamo immobili. Quindi se uno stratega dovrebbe, diciamo così, in senso teorico, essere maggiormente a conoscenza di tutto ciò che riguarda il soggetto, possibilmente se 
fossimo in grado di nascondere qualcosa al tattico, eh, questo è meglio, potrebbe essere meglio a mio avviso perché consente una maggiore mobilità anche di immaginazione nella tattica, per carità non questioni assolute ma conoscere esattamente tutte le questioni, tutti gli elementi che potrebbero causare una sconfitta piuttosto che semplicemente avere un effetto negativo sulla tattica in sé spesso e più o meno volentieri rende immobile la tattica. Quindi già vediamo che tra strategia e tattica, tra strategia e tattico i mestieri sono diversi, o almeno dovrebbero essere diversi. Questa distinzione raramente si incontra in forma pura, ma dovrebbero essere diversi nella conoscenza che si ha degli elementi. Il problema è capire di che cosa si tratta applicandolo, come dicevo, a due casi concreti che ci riguardano molto da vicino. Partiamo ad esempio dalla Germania per poi arrivare all'Italia, non ho scelto ovviamente la Germania, forse a caso, forse se c'è un paese europeo, come peraltro discretamente ovvio, che più è vicino e allo stesso tempo lontano, cioè più ci riguarda nella sua importanza sulla nostra traiettoria geopolitica, questo paese ovviamente è la Germania. Qual è la strategia della Germania e qual è la tattica della Germania? Aperta parentesi, se lo chiedessimo oggi ad uno stratega tedesco non sono sicuro ci risponderebbe in maniera lucidissima. La Germania ha vissuto una fase storica molto simile all'Italia, successiva alla Seconda Guerra Mondiale, una fase in cui è stato di fatto impedito ai tedeschi, anche ai più alti livelli, di pensare la strategia e allo stesso modo quindi la tattica per come volevano pensarla, semplicemente perché con la sconfitta della Seconda Guerra Mondiale sono diventati parte di una sfera di influenza altrui nella quale, abbiamo discusso spesso in questi giorni, non c'è l'assoluto arbitrio, ne eh, abbiamo dicevo, discusso in questi giorni in riferimento alla via della seta e all'Italia e ci tornerò nel passaggio successivo. Se noi dovessimo sciogliere, riducendone la complessità inevitabilmente in questi pochi minuti, in tre elementi qual è la strategia tedesca, incontreremo anzitutto la sua collocazione geografica che vedete qui alle mie spalle, manca l'aspetto fisico della carta ma la possiamo immaginare insieme. La Germania, come vedete, si pone al centro del continente, non, non per sua volontà. Eh, spesso si tratta, e qui torniamo al concetto iniziale, di qualcosa che esiste di per sé, per, cui la, per questo la strategia deve essere riconosciuta e non inventata. La Germania si trova al centro del continente, far finta di non saperlo, o anche se sembra banale, ma invece è molto complesso, non rendersene conto, cioè non capirlo, può creare gravi danni. Non solo si trova al centro del continente, ma è quasi esclusivamente priva di barriere orografiche, cioè non ha rilievi, non ha montagne che la mettano al sicuro da potenziali invasioni, se non quelle provenienti dal meridione, dal sud. Peraltro le Alpi abbiamo scoperto, noi italiani in primi, all'epoca i romani, ovviamente che sono una catena montuosa non difficile da attraversare. Uh, I romani l'hanno imparato sulla loro pelle e poi dovettero reagire proprio a questa scoperta. La Germania non ha barriere orografiche, quindi si trova al centro di un continente in posizione pianeggiante, che cosa vuol dire? È soggetta ad invasioni molteplici, tanto da est quanto da ovest. Di fatto si trova in una condizione più pericolosa della Russia, che ha questa identica assenza di barriere orografiche sul suo fronte occidentale, ma non altrettanto sul suo fronte orientale, non fosse altro perché i russi nel tempo sono stati capaci e bravi ad arrivare fino all'altra parte del planisfero, cioè fino alla fine della Siberia, all'estremo oriente asiatico. Quindi già abbiamo un elemento strategico tedesco evidente, cioè la fragilità inevitabile, eh, l'insicurezza inevitabile della Germania. Noi abbiamo l'idea della Germania come un paese estremamente arrogante e sicuro di sé, in realtà la Germania è necessariamente, fisiologicamente meglio, un paese insicuro. Il secondo elemento della strategia tedesca è quello che riguarda le enormi differenze subnazionali, ma qualcuno potrebbe lo fanno gli stessi tedeschi in molti casi, definirle nazionali, tra le genti che compongono lo spazio germanico. Noi abbiamo l'impressione che l'Italia sia un paese molto eterogeneo, culturalmente al suo interno, nulla di paragonabile a quello che capita in Germania, anche se noi fatichiamo a rendercene conto. Cioè i prussiani, che oggi non esistono più in questa edizione, ma con loro capitano ad esempio il Brandeburgo nel loro essere luterani, piuttosto che i bavaresi nel loro essere cattolici, ma così i renani, piuttosto che gli anseatici, eccetera, eccetera, tutte le genti che storicamente compongono lo spazio tedesco spesso non si riconoscono di pari dignità culturale, cioè si riconoscono come nazioni distinte che non pertengono e non compongono lo stesso insieme nazionale. 
ed è qualcosa che da sempre segna la storia tedesca. Se noi volessimo allargare il quadro ci renderemmo anche conto che non tutti i tedeschi, nel senso non tutti i germanici che parlano tedesco vivono in Germania, ci sono milioni di questi che vivono in Austria e si definiscono austriaci, altri che vivono in Svizzera e si definiscono svizzeri. Questo all'Italia di fatto non capita, se non vogliamo considerare le poche migliaia di italofoni che vivono in Svizzera o considerare San Marino una nazione realmente straniera. Quindi abbiamo già due elementi, la Germania è un paese che non ha barriere di difesa reali e non ha la capacità fra le sue genti di riconoscersi nello stesso momento in cui esistono. La terza caratteristica, questa già più recente della storia tedesca, che riguarda lo sviluppo industriale del paese, quindi siamo già nella seconda metà del XIX secolo, è la straordinaria capacità dell'industria tedesca di produrre molto più di quanto il paese possa assorbire. Di qui una necessità di esportare massicciamente verso l'esterno per mantenere eh, costante la ricchezza della popolazione. Da questi tre elementi, ripeto, siamo comunque in una semplificazione necessaria nel poco tempo a disposizione, ma che è molto pregnante nel darci l'idea di che cos'è la strategia tedesca, derivano i tre obiettivi strategici necessari della Germania. Il primo è impedire invasioni via terra, storicamente via terra nei confronti del paese, tanto da est quanto da ovest, che la Germania ha subito ciclicamente nella sua storia. In che modo? Potendo, quello che vorrebbero fare tutti i paesi se potessero, allargare la cosiddetta profondità difensiva, cioè allontanare da sé la prima linea difensiva, cioè potersi difendere in territorio altrui, per farla ancora più semplice, non dentro casa, ma a casa di qualcun altro, così di avere un margine d'errore evidentemente maggiore. Nel caso in cui fossimo immediatamente sconfitti potremmo ritirarci, andare indietro e rallentare l'avanzata del nemico. Di qui anche il tentativo che nella storia la Germania ha perseguito, condotto fino al parossismo, di anticipare invasioni che immaginavi imminenti, non per cattiveria. Nella geopolitica, se ha un, una delle fortune che le riconosciamo, l'aspetto che almeno dovrebbe avere totalmente a ideologico, cioè non esistono buoni e cattivi, non c'è questa moralistica dimensione dicotomica in, in geopolitica, le nazioni tendono ad essere buone e cattive allo stesso modo, eh, semplicemente perché devono fare ciò che devono, la Germania si è ritrovata anche commettendo gravi errori ad anticipare invasioni che immaginava eh, ormai imminenti nelle ultime guerre mondiali piuttosto che in altre fasi della sua storia, quindi si è trovata spesso, avrete notato, nella storia a combattere guerre su due fronti non soltanto per errore, proprio perché non ha di quella sicurezza che invece vorrebbe avere sul piano delle barriere orografiche. L'altro elemento strategico che parte da questi tre è quello di una necessaria coesione da realizzare fra le genti germaniche, che inizialmente si è eh, realizzato con la forza, con un modello culturale, cioè quello prussiano che si è imposto sugli altri attraverso l'unificazione e poi l'annessione molti anni dopo, Uh, poco prima della seconda guerra mondiale dell'Austria all'interno della stessa Germania, del Reich e che ancora oggi viene perseguito e proveremo a vedere come. Il terzo elemento strategico che è quello di una produzione, un surplus di produzione che deve essere piazzato all'estero proprio per capacità eccessive, che è sicuramente un pregio, intendiamoci, dell'industria tedesca che negli anni ha reso la Germania di fatto una potenza sempre mercantilistica, cioè la ricerca di mercati nei quali esportare massicciamente, allo stesso tempo, e questo è il rovescio della medaglia, di risorse da accaparrarsi per sostenere tale produzione. Sul piano tattico, oggi, visto che non abbiamo il tempo di farne tutta la storia, come si realizzano questi elementi strategici tedeschi? È evidente che con la sconfitta nella Seconda Guerra Mondiale e l'inserimento della Germania nello spazio americano, il fatto che gli Stati Uniti abbiano dominato e continuino a dominare il continente da allora anche oggi, ha reso fino alla fine della guerra fredda, soprattutto esclusivamente anzi sul fronte occidentale, sicura la Germania di una non invasione francese, che è da sempre l'incubo per eccellenza della Germania. La Germania non ha mai temuto un'invasione italiana da sud, questo mi sembra evidente, ma ha sempre temuto e l'ha anche ricevuta eh, un'invasione francese da occidente. Attraverso il sistema di influenza americano questa era impedita dal fatto che anche la Francia era inserita nella sfera di influenza statunitense, non solo, gli americani imposero a francesi e tedeschi di comporre l'asserena, il cosiddetto asserenano, che poi nella uh, pedagogia europeistica è stato descritto come 
è la creazione dell'integrazione europea che è di fatto un'imposizione statunitense della fine della seconda guerra mondiale. Dall'altro lato il fronte orientale, la Germania come sapete ovviamente è stata divisa al termine della seconda guerra mondiale, poi si è riunificata come dicono i tedeschi al fine della guerra fredda con l'allargamento della Nato, quindi ancora una volta con lo spazio di influenza militare statunitense nel continente, allargamento che ha condotto la Nato fino al confine della Russia attuale, la Germania ha trovato sicurezza anche sul suo fronte orientale, quindi oggi sul piano tattico non per volontà propria nel caso specifico, ma perché parte di una sfera di influenza altrui, questi due elementi la Germania li ha tatticamente risolti. Così allo stesso modo si può dire che abbia risolto al suo interno le differenze fra agenti tedesche in quale maniera? Attraverso il cosiddetto surplus commerciale, che è qualcosa che riguarda l'Italia direttamente da vicino. Spesso viene chiesto alla Germania di redistribuire il surplus commerciale all'interno della costruzione europea perché altrimenti si dice che l'euro non può sopravvivere senza questo tipo di aggiustamenti. La Germania puntualmente risponde no, almeno finora. Il surplus commerciale nella testa dei tedeschi e anche nella pratica serve a mantenere alto il livello di welfare, forse uno dei migliori, anzi senza il forse, uno dei migliori eh, welfare inteso come stato sociale al mondo è certamente quello tedesco ma non solo perché ai tedeschi piace vivere ad un alto standard per quanto riguarda la qualità della vita, ma perché il welfare è sempre servito dalla seconda guerra mondiale ad oggi a livellare le differenze fra le diverse genti che compongono la Germania, quindi a perseguire tatticamente l'elemento strategico che è il secondo, cioè la differenza fra i popoli che compongono la Germania, che avendo almeno un livello di welfare identico possono riconoscersi identici nella convenienza e nell'appartenenza conveniente allo Stato federale. Il terzo elemento strategico, che è quello di un surplus eh, industriale da piazzare all'estero, viene, questo non è cambiato molto, praticamente perseguito prima della Seconda Guerra Mondiale anche attraverso la forza, cioè cercando nuovi sbocchi commerciali, aprendoli con la forza, dalla Seconda Guerra Mondiale ad oggi, su incentivo degli Stati Uniti, per ragioni che oggi non indagheremo ma che sono abbastanza ovvie, si è potuto realizzare soltanto come potenza economicistica, cioè sfruttando l'ombrello difensivo statunitense per dedicarsi soltanto alle esportazioni. Di qui un'altra necessità che ci serve immediatamente passando all'Italia e avviandomi alla conclusione di questo mio intervento, la necessità per la Germania di avere, se possibile, il maggior numero di paesi che dispongono della sua stessa moneta verso i quali esportare necessariamente proprio per realizzare il terzo elemento strategico della Germania che ho provato a spiegare. Come riguarda tutto questo l'Italia? Se volessimo descrivere la strategia italiana, sempre in forma molto veloce, dietro di me vedete una carta realizzata da Laura Canali che è frutto del nostro numero, cioè immaginare quale debba essere la strategia e allo stesso tempo la tattica dell'Italia in questa fase che trovate ovviamente qui fuori dalla sala in forma ingrandita, L'Italia ha di fatto tre elementi strategici da perseguire necessariamente. Il primo è evitare di subire invasioni dal mare, anche se l'Italia fatica a pensarsi paese marittimo, ci siamo quasi convinti di essere un paese continentale, un po' per paura del mare, il mare ci spaventa molto in questa fase, come ben sappiamo, un po' per complesso di inferiorità, dobbiamo essere onesti verso le nazioni nordiche dell'Europa e a volte ci piace immaginarci nordici, lontani dalla dimensione mediterranea, quindi eh, meridionale ma addirittura sudista in senso dispregiativo della questione. Ma l'elemento strategico principale dell'Italia è evitare invasioni provenienti dal mare, quindi come corollario, come perseguimento dell'obiettivo, se possibile, controllare le coste antistanti all'Italia. Come la Germania attraverso dicevo, invasioni preventive dei paesi vicini, l'Italia, come fecero i romani quando resero un lago di fatto il mare mediterraneo, se potesse, Oggi è ovviamente impossibile, dovrebbe essere questo il perseguimento dell'elemento strategico. Il secondo elemento per quanto riguarda l'Italia è la sua coesione interna, non, non soprattutto legata all'elemento culturale. Gli italiani in realtà, anche se quando viene spiegata agli italiani hanno reazioni più o meno isteriche, sono un paese nettamente più omogeneo di quanto credano, ma le differenze geografiche e orografiche rendono difficile la coesione all'interno del Paese, cioè proprio complessa da attraversare la penisola, come ben sappiamo, e dunque è necessario come elemento strategico evitare che l'Italia si spezzi sotto gli occhi dei suoi governanti, cioè come è capitato troppe volte nella storia e per troppi secoli che l'Italia diventi 
una composizione di stati differenti e poi possa essere usata questa composizione contro gli stessi interessi della penisola dalle potenze straniere. Terzo elemento strategico dell'Italia è un elemento simile a quello della Germania, cioè la necessità anche per capacità straordinaria dell'Italia, soprattutto nella sua zona, come sappiamo, regionale centro-settentrionale, di esportare più di quanto si possa immaginare per capacità di produrre nettamente maggiore, maggiore rispetto alle capacità di assorbire la produzione, cioè siamo talmente capaci che tendiamo a produrre più di quanto eh, avremo bisogno di per sé, dunque siamo una nazione manifatturiera, dunque abbiamo bisogno di mercati di sbocchi per mantenere il nostro benessere. Tatticamente oggi come perseguiamo questi elementi strategici che come detto esistono di per sé e vanno riconosciuti ma non inventati? Li perseguiamo, quello riguardante la possibile invasione dal mare, cioè la necessità se vogliamo capovolgerlo, di controllare le coste antistanti all'Italia, come abbiamo fatto nei secoli. Non era un caso che l'Italia avesse in una sua fase la Libia, piuttosto che l'Albania, eccetera. L'Italia in questo momento fa ciò che può, cioè non è una nazione sovrana, ovviamente fa parte di una sfera di influenza altrui, anche questo ricordarselo è utile quando poi si persegue la tattica per evitare di compiere azioni avventate, è semplicemente parte dell'ombrello militare americano, cioè della Nato, se vogliamo dirla in forma più edulcorata, fa parte dell'Alleanza Atlantica e quindi prova ad immaginare invasioni provenienti dall'esterno accollandole anche a tutti gli altri che compongono il sistema di difesa atlantico. Eh, se vediamo, se vogliamo avere un metro per valutare la capacità di una nazione di difendersi oltre le sue necessità, Basti vedere, è evidentemente un elemento crudele, quali territori che geograficamente non le apparterebbero fanno invece parte della sua conformazione statuale. Noi notiamo che l'Italia, se ne può discutere a lungo, senza entrare nel merito, non dispone neanche della Corsica, che geograficamente fa parte, probabilmente, anzi senza probabilmente, del suo impianto geografico, ma che non è da molti secoli nella sua disponibilità. E dalla Seconda Guerra Mondiale ad oggi l'Italia si... Eh, inserisce nella prevenzione delle invasioni facendo parte dell'ombrello della Nato. Il secondo elemento, e questo è più complesso, e mi avvia alla conclusione, quello che riguarda la coesione interna del Paese e qui la difficoltà tattica di realizzarlo è sotto gli occhi di tutti. Si è discusso in questi giorni al Festival di Limes, continueremo a farlo probabilmente anche nelle prossime ore, dei tentativi di maggiore autonomia, inizialmente fiscali ma non soltanto, si immaginano anche culturali delle regioni più benestanti, più produttive del Paese quindi aumentando il divario, lo iato esistente tra il centro, tra lo Stato centrale e quindi l'idea stessa di unità della nazione e il resto delle sue parti. È evidente che se il primo elemento, non, non soltanto e non soprattutto per nostre capacità, possiamo definirlo parzialmente non all'ordine del giorno, cioè quello di subire un'invasione reale, non quella dei migranti, da parte di nazioni ostile, l'elemento di unitarietà necessaria, geografica e dunque eh, amministrativa all'interno del Paese, questo sta svanendo con rischi molto gravi che evidentemente la nostra classe politica non riesce a cogliere di per sé oppure coglie e considera meno rilevanti. Da ultimissimo la necessità per l'Italia di esportare e quindi di avere mercati di sbocco che è molto simile alla Germania e qui la strategia e dunque la tattica tedesca ed italiana vanno ad incontrarsi e a scontrarsi allo stesso tempo. Ed è essenziale comprenderlo per capire che cosa ci sta succedendo intorno. Se è vero che la Germania non vuole redistribuire ricchezza, almeno fino a questo momento all'interno del sistema dell'Eurozona, non perché sono dei cattivoni, ma perché semplicemente immaginano il surplus commerciale come elemento essenziale del loro welfare, che serve allo stesso tempo a tenere unita la nazione tedesca, quindi non troviamo possibilità di intenderci su questo piano, non avremo bisogno di una ridistribuzione della ricchezza all'interno del sistema, visto che la Germania è un esportatore netto ed è perno dell'Eurozona, ciò su cui ci troviamo, ma anche questo quasi incomprensibile nel momento attuale, è la necessità per la Germania di tenerci dentro l'euro a tutti i costi. È evidente che se noi non conosciamo gli elementi strategici e dunque la tattica tedesca che si applica attraverso gli elementi strategici, ne sentiamo dire con grande disinvoltura diverse amenità al riguardo. Uno, una delle parti classiche della vulgata di questi nostri tempi è attenzione che la Germania o in forma edulcorata l'Europa, più o meno figurata, ma si tratta di Germania, che la Germania ci caccia dall'euro. L'avrete sentito 
molte volte, il che è semplicemente impossibile sul piano razionale, poi non tutti i soggetti geopolitici compiono esclusivamente scelte razionali, la Germania come tutti gli altri nella sua storia ha attraversato periodi di irrazionalità, certamente, ma se dovessimo semplicemente valutarne l'aspetto tattico la Germania dall'euro non caccia nessuno perché ha come necessità strategica declinata in questa tattica di tenere dentro il maggior numero di, di nazioni possibile, perché se è vero che necessita di esportare più che può, altrettanto necessita di avere paesi che abbiano la sua stessa moneta così che dispongano del potere d'acquisto necessario ad acquistarne i prodotti. Figurarsi noi che siamo uno dei paesi più grandi sia sul piano demografico che di benessere, anche se facciamo fatica a ricordarcelo, dell'eurozona. Ed è qui che l'atteggiamento italiano nei confronti della Germania può tatticamente mutare, perché se noi siamo a conoscenza di questo elemento superiore, cioè che la Germania non caccia nessuno, ma che anzi, al di là del blef, perché anche la Germania, come tutte le nazioni, bleffa nei confronti delle altre, quando si erge a maestra severa, ma al di là del blef la Germania ti tiene dentro finché può, l'Italia potrebbe perseguire un maggiore margine di manovra nei confronti della Germania, se se ne rendesse conto. Tutto questo per darvi un'idea di che cos'è la strategia e la tattica e come queste si applicano evidentemente ai casi concreti partendo da una distinzione delle due per arrivare poi ad un'applicazione su due casi concreti, uno italiano, talmente concreto che non ha bisogno di spiegazione, l'altro tedesco per evidente corrispondenza tra le due nazioni nel momento attuale. Io mi fermo qui, lascio la parola a Jacob Shapiro che invece ci introduce all'elemento culturale della strategia e dunque della tattica americana e come questa ancora oggi si applica a casi concreti. Grazie. Good morning everyone. Um, thank you for spending your Sunday morning talking to us about strategy and theory. It's, a, it's an honor to be here speaking with you. Um, before I start, I just wanted to jump off of two things that, that Dario said. The first is that at one point, as he was explaining strategy, he said he was simplifying and that he, had, he was just giving kind of a gist or a, a summary of the strategy because we had a limited amount of time. And I just wanted to say that strategy, the the components of strategy are very complex. Uh, they are the most important things that are at the soul of any nation. So if you want to think about a nation's strategy, you have to think about what a nation fears, what a nation loves, uh, what its geography has defined its worldview as. These are very serious, complex things to think about. The articulation of strategy, though, should be very simple. If you have someone articulating strategy to you, and it's not clear what the strategy is, that's bad strategy. Strategy should be very clear. It should, you should be able to say it in a sentence, maybe two sentences, so that you know what the objective is. The moment you can't talk to yourself in a clear way about what your strategy is, you're out of the realm of strategy. You're really just talking to yourself. Um, the second thing I would say is when he was talking about Germany, I was just reminded of the, the famous Goethe quote where he said in, uh, in 1812 that Germany was so honorable in the individual and so wretched in the multitude. And I don't know why that came to mind, but when we were talking about German strategy, that was just in my mind from somebody who probably knew the German soul better than anyone. Um, so I'm American, so perhaps my straightforwardness and bluntness with strategy is informed by my Americanness. Uh, but I'll try to tell you how I see strategy. Um, and for me, we have to start by saying that there are two kinds of strategy. Uh, one kind of strategy is simply what you do in order to achieve a goal. So let's take an example. Um, the United States signed the Iran nuclear deal a couple years ago, and then a couple years afterwards, the Trump administration tore it up. Um, the strategy there was actually the same in both cases. Uh, every single U.S. presidential administration since 1979 has wanted to change the nature of the Iranian government, period, every single one. Uh, the Obama administration signed the Iran nuclear deal because its strategy was more of a soft strategy, for lack of a better word. 
The idea was that the United States would engage with Iran on a more equal level. It would open up the floodgates of foreign investment into the Iranian economy. It would allow Iran to watch movies like Star Wars and listen to Justin Bieber and do all of the things that would liberalize society. And perhaps over time, Iran would stop listening to the supreme leader and would start trying to define for itself, for its people, what it wanted that was best. Um, the United States also had, along with that, it had a problem in the sense that ISIS was in the Middle East. And ISIS for both Iran and the United States was a common enemy. So this seemed a good time to try that strategy. Um, again, though, the end goal was change the fundamental nature of the Iranian regime. Now, the Trump administration comes to power, and it decides it wants nothing to do with the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it's actually the same strategy. It just doesn't want to engage with Iran. It's more of a hard strategy. So the Trump administration not only tears up the Iran nuclear deal, but it decides to put sanctions on any individual, any business operating in Iran. The goal here is to put enough pressure on the Iranian economy that the Iranian people again, stop listening to the supreme leader. So there's something here about strategy where and there's tactics and there's policy and there's strategy, and I'll get to all of those in a second. But I just want you to see that in that particular case, the strategy is actually the same, even if two very, very different things are happening. Um, that's one kind of strategy. That's strategy at its very simplest. You have a goal, you do X, Y, and Z, you achieve your goal. Uh, the next kind of strategy is what I would call grand strategy. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to see if the other panelists will conceptualize this the way that I do as an American. Uh, but for me, grand strategy is really what we're talking about here when we're talking about geopolitics. And the, the most important thing to understand about grand strategy is you don't get to choose your grand strategy. Your grand strategy basically chooses you. Uh, Dario was saying this in a fashion, in the sense that you don't, you are given certain things. Germany can't decide not to be on the Northern European plane. It just can't do it. It's always going to be on the Northern European plane. Grand strategy is always defined by things outside of your control. Um, you might be able to choose different ways that you want to deal with your grand strategy, but no matter what you do, your grand strategy is never actually going to change. You might even justify the things that you do to yourself in different ways. And the, defini the definition of that process is ideology. Ideology is really just a myth that you tell yourself at the end of the day to justify all the things that you are doing in pursuit of a grand strategy. And sometimes nations have a grand strategy that they are able to articulate, and sometimes they can't even articulate it. They are just moving in a direction, the same direction that they've always moved in, but it's there nonetheless. Um, so let's look at the previous example for me to make that a little less ethereal, a little less theoretical. Uh, so I was talking about how the Trump administration and the Obama administration both wanted to make the current Iranian political regime weaker. What is the grand strategy of the United States, in the Middle East in particular? The grand strategy of the United States in the Middle East is that no single power should dominate the Middle East. It's very similar to the United States' strategy with Eurasia. No single power should be able to dominate all of Eurasia. Uh, when the Islamic State declared its caliphate back in 2015, the United States did not have to intervene because the Islamic State was so reprehensible. It was reprehensible. But the United States was not there because they were chopping people's heads off and sending videos out of them. The problem with the Islamic State was that it was threatening to become a major Sunni Arab force in the heart of the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's hard to remember now, but in 2016, there was a very, people were talking about the Islamic State being able to take control of Damascus. People were worried about a march on Damascus by the Islamic State. That is precisely the reason that the United States decided that it had to re-engage, even put some more troops back into Iraq at the time in order to do it, not, not a place that we particularly wanted to revisit. Um, once the Islamic State was defeated, what happened? Well, Iran surged into the vacuum that was left by the Islamic State. You had tens of thousands of Iranian militia uh, in Iraq, in Syria, all the way out to Lebanon, 
suddenly the door was open for Iran to become not only a major Middle Eastern power, but to extend power all the way out to the Mediterranean. So whether it was Donald Trump or whether it was Hillary Clinton, at that moment the United States was going to have a difficult decision to make with the Iran nuclear deal and with Iran in general, because at that point Iran was tripping on the grand strategy of the United States in the region. If you are looking at the future of the Middle East, I think that the future of the Middle East's grand strategy from the United States perspective is the question of Turkey. What is going to happen with Turkey? Because Turkey is becoming much more powerful. We are already seeing that it is engaging inside of Syria. It will not stop there, I guarantee that. I think in the long term, the United States is going to have problems with Turkey because Turkey's grand strategy in itself is to be the dominant power in the Middle East. So you're going to see, you, you've already begun to see the United States and Turkey diverge a little bit. And the media and the press will tell you, well, that's because Erdogan is an authoritarian, or that's because Erdogan and Trump don't get along, or that it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that U.S. grand strategy is to prevent a dominant power in the Middle East. Turkish grand strategy is to be the dominant power in the Middle East, and they are becoming strong enough to project that power. So you have a problem. Um, let me take another example, and I, I thought it would be fun as an American to tell you what an American's view of grand strategy would be of Italian grand strategy. Uh, maybe I can also talk about U.S. grand strategy later on. Um, but I thought it would be interesting if from an American perspective, I told you if I was just looking at Italy, what I would see. And the first thing that I would talk about with Italy is that I think the number one strategic challenge that Italy has, and this is true of most countries, but particularly for Italy, is to unify itself despite its internal geographic disadvantages. Um, Italy's biggest threat is that it's going to come apart at the seams. Italy does not have to worry about invasion from Russia the way that Poland or even Germany have to worry about invasion from Russia. It just isn't within <coughs> Italy's frame of reference. Um, Italy, if you look back in its history, why were there so many individual Italian city-states that were squabbling with each other and fighting with each other and vying for power? It's because you have these natural pockets of different political tendencies inside the country that like to fight against each other. Um, why, uh, this is also why it took Italy, and I think Germany is in this category too, it's why it took it so much longer to congeal as a nation in the age of nationalism than it did a country like Spain or a country like France, which by the 1600s were already coming together. It took Italy until the 1800s to really merge into a modern nation state. But let me take it a step further. What are Italy's biggest external threats? Once, once you get the unity, once we're in the, you know, everything is unified, you're in the state that you are today. Um, it's not necessarily, the, Italy's biggest threat is not necessarily from Europe. Now, it is true that your economy today is incredibly enmeshed within the European Union's economy, it's especially enmeshed in the German economy. So you have a lot of economic exposure uh, when it comes to the European continent. But strategy is not economics. Strategy goes above and beyond economics. You should think of strategy and grand strategy as the things that you do irrespective of economics. Some things will be more e economically beneficial, some will be less. Strategists are not thinking about what, how to make money, they're thinking about how to defend the nation, right? Um, so if you look at a map, and maybe, could you pull up the map, Laura, uh, Laura's map that you had earlier of Italy? Um, if you look at a map of Italy, the, the thing that jumps out uh, is that of all the major European countries, uh, Italy is not a European country, it's a Mediterranean country. It's the only one. I mean, look at the map. Spain on the Atlantic. France, outlets to the Atlantic. Italy is the only major country in all of Europe to be primarily a Mediterranean power. So what does that mean? Your biggest external threats are if somebody wants to block trade routes, right? So you, you even have little circles there. Gibraltar, if anyone was going to take over Gibraltar and block Gibraltar, existential threat right there. If anybody was going to block the Suez Canal, existential threat. Um, why did Constantine the Great found the city that is today called Istanbul? He's in the fourth century, he's a Roman emperor, the Roman Empire is coming apart at the seams. Uh, why does he put such a focus on Constantinople, which becomes Istanbul? It's because he knew that he needed the most strategic city in the Mediterranean to be firmly in Roman hands at the time. That was his biggest strategic threat at the top of his mind. He has to think about that once he consolidates the Roman Empire. 
what is one of the reasons that Italy is, I think, friendlier and more pragmatic with Russia than a lot of other European countries? Well, for both Italy and Russia, Turkey is a major threat. If you're looking at that map, Turkey is one of the countries that you have to be most afraid of because, you know, if you look at history, the Ottoman Empire in the past fielded magnificent navies that could have blockaded you at any point. When you have a rising Turkey, that is something Italy has to worry about. It's definitely something that Russia has to worry about too. If you look at Russia on the map, it gets, it can't even get to the Mediterranean if it doesn't go through, um, if it doesn't go through Turkey and the Black Sea and then it gets to all the major focal trade points. So if I'm an American strategist, those to me are the first things that I'm looking at when I'm talking about Italy. Now, you can use all kinds of different strategies and tactics to handle challenges, and you can use ideology to justify these strategies. But like I said, the, the tricky thing about grand strategy is to remember that fundamentally it doesn't change. It's locked in. The challenges, the challenges that you're facing today are really just echoes of the challenges that you were facing in the past. And any Italian state, no matter what the government, no matter what the ideology, is going to be dealing with similar things. You have to make sure that there isn't a maritime force strong enough or that wants to block you from trading with the world. Uh, North Africa's problems are much more your problems than say they are Germany's or Poland's or Estonia's. You have to worry about what's going on in Tunisia. You have to worry about what's going on in Algeria because that has practical and concrete impacts on Italy. It's also a tremendous opportunity for Italy if, because you're so close to those areas. You can't imagine, if, if an Estonian strategic planner was here and says, ha, we must be worried about what's going on in Tunisia, you would laugh at him because he, he does not have your geography. He doesn't have to look at the world the same way that you do. Um, before I close, I just wanna, one thing that I often get asked when I talk about this is, what is the difference between strategy and policy then? What is policy in the first place? Are these just synonyms? Uh, or is there something different between strategy and policy? And the answer there is yes and no. It's confusing. Sometimes they can be the same, sometimes they can't be the same. Um, if policy just means the measures that you're going to take uh, to achieve a particular goal, then yes, there is a lot of harmony between strategy and policy. But oftentimes policy is simply wishful thinking. So a government will say, or a politician will say that he or she has a policy, but it's a policy that completely ignores grand strategy, it completely ignores geography, just tells you exactly what it is you wanna hear. Uh, a real, I was looking for a lot of examples of this and I think I settled on a good one. Um, you might not know this, but China has a Syria policy, right? China's Syria policy is that Assad should stay in power and that everyone should respect the Russian-run negotiations on Syria's future. Is that Chinese strategy? Is that Chinese grand strategy? It's neither, it's just official policy, and it happens to be irrelevant. China has no, it has nothing in the game here when it's going on with Syria. It's literally just talking to itself. Um, Karl von Clausewitz is a, is a Prussian thinker who I think those of us who think about grand strategy a lot refer to, um, and he dominates a lot of conversations even today in the United States about what strategy is. Uh, and he had a very helpful quote about strategy that I just wanted to read to you so that I get it right. Uh, Clausewitz wrote, and he's, he's writing in the 1700s, let's say. He wrote that tactics are what armies use to win battles, and strategy is the art of using battles to win wars. Right, so I'll say that again. Tactics are what armies use to win battles. Strategy is the art of using battles to win wars. And I can't help but think of the US's involvement in the Vietnam War when I think about that quote, because the United States won basically every battle it fought in the Vietnam War. It really didn't lose and in a lot of ways couldn't lose the battles that it fought. And yet, it lost the war, and I'm not even sure it really had to fight the war in the first place. Um, policy becomes a very dangerous thing because policy is usually confined to the realm of tactics. For a country to develop a geopolitical strategy, you really have to identify a grand strategy and then articulate strategies that help you get towards those goals. So I'll leave you with this. It, it is when a country starts thinking that with the right tactics, it's possible to change reality and possible to change your grand strategy that I think things become complicated. The way to develop a successful strategy is to recognize that strategy is about achieving goals 
and never about inventing desired outcomes, no matter how much you want them to come into being. Thank you. Grazie Jacob. Dopo il punto di vista americano sulla strategia statunitense e anche sull'Italia, do la parola all'ospite che è arrivato per ultimo, ma che è il professor Yougi, direttore del Dipartimento sul Governo e l'Amministrazione dell'Università di Macao, che invece ci fornirà la visione culturale cinese della strategia e come questa si applica oggi a casi concreti. Grazie, Chair. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to come back to this hall again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the topic of how China makes strategy can be simple and complicated. Uh, I'd like to mention three most important elements of China's strategies. Uh, that is ground strategy, national defense strategy, and the foreign policy strategy. But all these three strategies serve one particular concept, uh, the, the so-called core national interests. Uh, this co core concept itself is a kind a set of value which is in the category of culture. So I talk about this kind of uh, uh, core concepts uh, basically from two uh, perspectives. One is a political system, another is political culture. Uh, what the concept of political, uh, sorry, what the concept of core national interest entails, it entails three things. First one, regime survival or regime security. Second, uh, territorial and the sovereignty security. The third one, uh, the people's livelihood based on economic development. So I come uh, to the first regime security. Regime security and the insecurity is a very strong dynamics as far as China is concerned. Uh, China is vulnerable as it hasn't completed the political transformation. Uh, in particular, uh, at this particular moment, the Chinese government and the people alike face a fundamental challenge. That is, the society has become pluralistic, but the political system remains monolithic. So the contradiction between the grassroots society and the superstructure have become worsened and worsened. This is one of the reasons why they emphasize regime security as a national core interest, largely because without, from the Chinese perspective, official perspective, without stability, political, social, and economic, uh, there would be no development. At this uh, particular moment, the regime security is under challenges from both within and without. From within, we can see, uh, we can say that there is a mounting, we call the structural conflicts of interests between the state and the society. The official, uh, the, we call the abuse of power on the part of officials and the very often suffering of ordinary people generate a huge amount of disgruntlement uh, that threaten the communist rule um, that may repeat what happened in 1989. So this is a top priority for the party to make a grand strategy how to maintain the party's rule. This is uh, first thing uh, about the so-called the core national interests. Um, of course, uh, we talk about government structure. We talk about e uh, efficiency of the functioning of bureaucracy. Um, Govern, govern, uh, this entails issues such as corruption, incompetence of officials in making policies, and of course, in making strategies uh, as a whole. Uh, this is not resolved, and uh, probably the challenge is deepening uh, day by day. Uh, <coughs> that is one of the reasons why Xi Jinping tried to tighten the kind of control to ensure stability uh, by preventing any signs of maybe social disgruntlement to be erupted against ordinary governance. Uh, the second factor I'd like to say, uh, and your instruction, the 
role of strategic culture. Uh, the strategic culture entails three things, basically, as far as I'm concerned. The first one is the concept of a century of humiliation. That was the uh, history since 1840, when the Western powers invaded China numerous times, and China suffered as a result. So this generated a very deep national psyche. Now that, that is translated into national defense strategy and foreign policy strategy in the sense that without a powerful military, China will be always be vulnerable to such external threats. But when it comes to the concrete policies, now we see very toughened territorial policies under Xi Jinping because this is both for domestic consumption and for the protection of Chinese sovereignty overseas. Domestic, domestic pressure is mounting when the people pressured the government to act as tough as possible in protecting the territorial integrity under this kind of strategic culture of a century of humiliation that leaves the government uh, increasing, increasingly narrow the room for action or sometimes to force the government to take some of the policies to eliminate the green area we call ambigu uh, ambiguous area in which compromises can be made. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, political culture of nationalism. We, this is related to the first point I mentioned earlier. The third point is ideology, the so-called communist ideology, which has two functions. The, the first function is we call the make-believe system, that you indoctrinate people to truly believe in this value system called communism. Uh, so far, this function is increasingly losing its power of appeal to the population. Then it comes to the second function of this uh, ideology, which is a function of control. You occupy the people's minds with official ideas. Now the metaphor is like this. Your brain is limited to contain ideas. Now the more ideas we put into your brain, it is hard for other ideas to come back to, to penetrate into your brain. Now in this way, I think the function of control can be effective together with national education of nationalism, patriotism, and so on and so forth. This is very, very crucial uh, for the first uh, function, the first uh, element I mentioned earlier, that is the regime security, because uh, that is traditional Chinese political culture under the Confucianism, that is, people should have one thought. If they are confused in mind, they will be confused in action. This is a tradition of political culture against the pluralism. That is one of the reasons why the, the, the leaders in Beijing currently are promoting Confucianism in the most vigorous way, as I have witnessed from the Dang, from criticizing, criti uh, Confucianism in the Cultural Revolution. Now, to enshrine the very idea of stability, authoritarian, authoritarian obedience, and the unified thought under the so-called strategic and the traditional culture, political culture of Confucianism. So Confucianism, communism, functions of make-believe and functions of control, they are integrated together. Now, um, when we talk about the uh, second element of uh, core national interests, uh, the so-called territorial dis uh, security and the sovereignty security, first of all, this is the foundation of Chinese foreign policy, which we always talk about the foreign policy is extension of domestic politics. So pressure is mounting, as I mentioned earlier, on the current government to protect China's uh, territor uh, territories uh, now under dispute in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, uh, along the 
Sino Indian borders and so on and so forth. Uh, now this has become a top priority in Chinese foreign policy, especially under Xi Jinping. Under the previous leadership, Hu, Hu Jintao, uh, territorial integrity is, was very important, but in the strategic sequencing, strategic sequencing of priorities, the territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, rights should, be, should serve another set of top priorities, especially domestic stability. That is to say, if you emphasize too much on external you know, um, aggressiveness in protecting sovereignty, you may jeopardize the relationship, especially with the United States and the, and the peripheral countries, Asian Pacific countries, that would backlash against the efforts to stabilize domestic politics, especially to backlash against the peaceful environment for domestic development. So uh, in, Hu Jinpao, in Hu Jinpao's era, strategy to protect domestic stability was the top priority and the foreign policy and the territorial strategy served the ground strategy of domestic stability. In Xi Jinping's era, he realized that if you were too passive in protecting the sovereignty issues, in protecting China's sovereignty rights, you generate domestic backlash against your rule. You look soft in the eyes of the population that would equally jeopardize your concern of domestic stability. So under Xi Jinping, he adapted a two, we call the parallel emphasis on domestic stability on the one hand and the sovereignty stability on the other. So that was the beginning of a assertive period, assertive policy of the last five years. Now we see the uh, differences between him and Hu Jintao that in Hu Jintao's era, the Chinese efforts or policies to protect sovereignty was mounted in the manner of reactive actions. So you, our opponents made the first move, then we move, make the responsive move, even if our responsive move would be more severe. So you make one inch, we make 1.5 inch, but still uh, it is a reactive act and we do not make two inches because that would be proportionally backlash against us. So that was Hu Jintao's era, the emphasis in the secret strategic sequence. But under Xi Jinping, he made the proactive approaches to sovereignty issues such as, for example, land reclamation in the Sprat lease. So that was not a responsive move, that was a preemptive move. So that was a difference, very visible difference between him and his predecessor. So this strategic sequencing is very important. In his judgment, in this strategic uh, sequencing, the logic is, is like this. All other claimants have made land reclamation in the Sprat lease. Chan has not done so, especially in terms of airstrips in the Sprat list. Now, if we do not do it now, we may never do it. That was a decision in, 19, in, in 2013, because Xi Jinping was scheduled to visit Washington uh, nine months later. The COC negotiations were heated up. Code of conduct, negotiation between China and ASEAN. Most importantly, there would be a regime change in Taipei. When the pro-independence party came to power, that would leave increasingly smaller room for China to work very hard in the South China Sea because the priority would be shifted to the Taiwan Strait. So in this kind of reasoning, they made the uh, reclamation decision, even if they knew that would be very, very costly. But 
the calculation would be if we didn't do it now, if we do it later, it would be more costly or it would not be even be possible to do it. So this kind of uh, strategy and as our previous previous speaker talked about the strategy and the policy, next is our pol strategy and policy. Now this is a vivid expression. Uh, I think my time is up, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Grazie al professor Yoji. Avete ascoltato come tanto Jacob Shapiro prima di lui e il professor Yu hanno posto l'accento sul ruolo utile, essenziale dell'ideologia nel perseguimento della strategia e quindi della tattica che è un ruolo strumentale ma molto spesso, specialmente alle nostre latitudini, si scambia per l'obiettivo finale, cioè muoversi per ragioni valoriali o ideologiche. Eh, sentiamo dopo il professor Yoji. Qual è invece l'approccio culturale alla strategia e alla tattica russo? Grazie. Professor Dimitri Suslov. Grazie. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's an extremely interesting debate. Um, uh, you know, there is a, a stereotype uh, widely uh, shared in the West that Vladimir Putin uh, is a genius uh, tactician, but a disastrous uh, strategist. And that Russian foreign policy lacks uh, strategy, but it's just a tactical reactions to certain situations that emerge. I think it's false, uh, and with my presentation I will try to prove uh, that Russia actually does have a very sound foreign policy strategy, a grand strategy, which is uh, right now in the, um, uh, in the cause of fundamental readjustment because of the changing situation uh, in the world. As for ideology, I, let me start with this. You know, uh, ideology is not a uh, crucial, or in any case, I mean, is not a component of uh, Russian foreign policy strategy, of Russian grand strategy uh, right now. And this is one of the fundamental features of Russia's positioning, of Russia's foreign policy identity in the world today, that unlike us in the Soviet times or pre-Soviet times, we are not an ideological actor. You know, historically, Russia was a messianic country. The idea of Russia as the third Rome, uh, which existed since the uh, 16th century. Russian empire as the unifier and protector of all East Slavic and Orthodox peoples. Soviet Union as the uh, you know, leader of global communism and so on and so forth. That was an important uh, feature of previous uh, Russian foreign policy identity, but no longer today. And this fundamentally differentiates Russia now uh, from uh, Russia before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, talking about Russian foreign policy strategy uh, and grand strategy to, uh, uh, as, uh, as it is today, let me divide the major pillars and determinants uh, of this grand strategy into two groups. Uh, the first group uh, consists of more or less constant uh, permanent uh, uh, factors which constitute uh, Russian foreign policy philosophy and identity. Whereas the second group consists of variable determinants, uh, which change, sometimes fundamentally, change from time to time, and they explain crucial fluctuations, crucial shifts of Russian foreign policy. So what are the uh, constant determinants of Russian uh, foreign policy? I will uh, give you a list of six. First, of course, history. Uh, Russia was a great power since uh, at least Peter the Great's time. Uh, Russia is the country which defeated Napoleon and Hitler. Uh, as Great Britain, Russia is the country that was never defeated in a war uh, since the 13th uh, century. And also a very crucial component of Russian foreign policy identity is that Russia did not lose the Cold War. From the Russian perspective, the Cold War ended in 1989 through deliberate uh, decision and cooperation of both two superpowers and the collapse of the Soviet Union is of fundamentally different nature. It is not a product of the end of the Cold War. So uh, the attitude is that the end of the Cold War is one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. 
whereas the collapse of the Soviet Union, as Vladimir Putin uh, said, is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe uh, of the 20th century. They are two absolutely distinct things. Secondly, uh, the history of invasions uh, into Russia, and since the 16th century, uh, the West was basically the major uh, invader, starting with Poland and then France and uh, Germany. And this historically predetermined the Russian interest in having a buffer zone uh, in Europe. However, I would say today with the new types of warfare, uh, this is no longer valid. Russia no longer needs the buffer zone uh, in Europe to be militarily protected. Third uh, permanent component is religion and a Russian Orthodox Church still positions itself as the major church of East Slavic peoples, not just of Russians, but also of Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, this is why Tomos uh, for Ukraine uh, now is of crucial importance, of course, of negative uh, factor for, uh, for Russia. Culture, and yesterday night you heard, you know, some of the tiny features, I would say, of the uh, Russian big culture. Uh, geography, the thing that uh, Russia is located both in Europe and in Asia, and the majority of Russian territory is in Asia, uh, not in Europe. And finally, the size of territory. Um, Russia is the biggest country in the world territorially, uh, and this territory needs to be uh, controlled and protected. So these pillars constitute Russian uh, international identity, which I would describe as independent global great power independent global great power, independent from both the West and from the East, including from China. And this uh, Russian foreign policy identity remains largely the same for the last several decades, and this explains continuity of uh, Russian foreign policy. The other uh, group uh, of determinants of Russian foreign policy strategy uh, consists of the variable factors, which are basically first, the Russian perception of the external environment, uh, the state of the international system and its evolution, distribution of power, the Russian perception of threats and opportunities uh, in the world, and secondly, dynamics of Russian economic and military development. And these explain fundamental changes of Russian foreign policy in the, in, in the last several decades. They explain, for instance, why in, why, in one situation, Russia is trying to establish partnership with the West, even membership in the West. And in the other situation, Russia allows confrontation uh, with the West and proclaims turn to the East and greater Eurasia instead of uh, greater Europe. Why in 2004, um, Russia reacted to the Ukrainian turn to the West by using the gas instrument Whereas in a pretty similar situation in 2014, Russia reacted by annexing Crimea and invading East, uh, uh, East Ukraine. So these uh, changes are explained by these uh, uh, variable groups, uh, variable determinants of Russian foreign policy. So the constant feature of Russian foreign policy uh, since 1990s has been and still is consolidation of Russian status as role and status and role and as independent global great power and persuading the other major actors to recognize Russia as such. And as soon as they do recognize Russia as independent global great power, fix according rules of the game. So great power for Russia is something like leadership for the United States, I would say. Uh, what kind of meaning does Russia put into this term, great power? What does it mean in practice? And I would give you a list of seven components of what Russia uh, regards as essentially uh, important components of Russian uh, great power uh, role. First, it means that Russia conducts fully independent domestic and foreign policy, not you know, impacted by the external uh, factors. Secondly, Russia is absolutely self-reliant in defense. It doesn't need anyone to defend itself. And Russia participates only in Russia-centric or Russia-led military alliances. 
This is, by the way, one of the reasons why we won't have a military alliance uh, with China. The military alliance that Russia has is the collective security treaty organization in the post-Soviet space, which uh, Russia dominates. Third, uh, Russia is able to defeat and deter any aggressor and prevail in regional conflicts in the Russian periphery. Fourth, Russia maintains Russia-centric economic and security orders in its own neighborhood, Eurasian Economic Union and Collective Security Treaty Organization, and considers respect of these orders by the third players as determinant of Russia's relations with the third players. And it also works for both China and, uh, and the West. And the difference is that China does respect these orders, whereas the West doesn't. You know, and we have the consequences for Russia's relations with these uh, uh, powers. So Russia prevents the members of this regional Russia-centric order uh, from joining the other economic and uh, security orders. Uh, and Russia can easily tolerate, for instance, some of the post-Soviet countries like Uzbekistan or Azerbaijan not to participate in Russia-centric organizations. But what Russia will never tolerate is their membership in the other, not Russia-centric security orders and organizations. In this case, uh, Russia will use everything possible to uh, prevent uh, uh, their accession to the, uh, to the alien uh, uh, security and uh, economic orders and would resist attempt of the third players to pull these countries out of the Russia-centric uh, arrangements. Fifth, uh, Russia takes active and permanent part in global decision-making on par with other centers of power, especially on the issues of sovereignty and the use of force, and considers unilateral decisions on these issues despite the Russian objections as violations of Russian great power status. Some people ask why did Russia so vigorously uh, reacted to the NATO uh, uh, aggression against Yugoslavia, US invasion of Iraq, NATO destruction of Libya. I mean, Russia does not have vital security interest there. From the Russian perspective, these violations of the international law is not just about these countries. These are humiliations of Russia. These are attacks against the Russian great power status because if Russia is sidelined from decision making over the use of force against those countries, it means that Russia is not regarded as Russia should be regarded, right? Not as the country which should participate in every single decision making in the world about the use of force and about uh, security, territorial, and uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity uh, uh, issues. Sixth component, Russia pursues principles of diplomatic and quality and reciprocity with other poles, both Western and non-Western. And finally, seventh, uh, Russia creates and manages international orders, regional and global, together and on par with other centers of power. And these orders should be jointly elaborated, like we do with China uh, in Greater Eurasia, not imposed by either the West or Russia or uh, China or any, uh, any, any players. Jointly liberated, not, uh, not imposed. So all these features manifest continuity of Russian foreign policy. And from this list, I make a conclusion that the majority of challenges that Russia faces today are political, basically, not military. Militarily, Russia is quite a secure country right now. And, um, Today, when you don't need large-scale invasions like in uh, Second World War, Russia is quite a secure country. After military modernization, uh, we are able to prevail in any regional limited conflict, in any of them, either in, in the Black Sea region or in the Baltic Sea region. If a regional conflict occurs there, we will win, no question about that. And we have nukes. Uh, to deter a large-scale war. And the purpose of Russian nuclear weapons is not just preventing a nuclear attack against Russia. It is preventing any war against Russia. And believe me, if a large-scale war occurs, Russia will use nuclear weapons. Right? That's, that, that's a core component of the Russian uh, military strategy. So this is permanent. What is changing and changing fundamentally is the external context. And 
Of course, when the world was really West-centric, when the American hegemony seemed unchallenged, and when European Union seemed to be the only center of growth, modernity, and modernization in the Russian neighborhood, Russian foreign policy was West-centric. However, each time when Russia tried to join the West, as one of the leaders, of course, because joining the West as a junior member does not correspond to the permanent features of Russian foreign policy, to the great power role uh, that I described before. Uh, um, uh, so each time when Russia tried to join the West as a, uh, one of the leaders, it was rejected. And the last rejection, which happened about 15 years ago, coincided with a fundamental shift of how Russia sees the world. And today, Russia does not see the world as West-centric or world-dominated. And that's a fundamental feature of Russian foreign policy strategy. In a post-West world, in a, a world in which the United States is no longer able to determine, and, uh, and, uh, to determine the global development and development of key regions. The world in which the Pacific, not the Atlantic, is the centerpiece of world economy and world politics. And a world in which the two major economies by 2050 will be China and India, and the US only the third one. And by 2050, the economy of India alone will be bigger than the economy of the European Union together, right? In this world, there is no need for Russia actually to uh, pursue a West-centric, let alone Europe-centric, foreign policy. On the contrary, such policy would result to Russia's marginalization in, uh, uh, in the global scale. And this predetermined a fundamental shift of Russian strategic thinking, which, is, which has already happened by now. Rejection of West centricism in both positive and negative sense. And start the policy of turn to the East. You know, for Russia, to become a recognized, full-fledged player, we need to be in the Pacific. We need to be a recognized great power in the Pacific. This is a matter of survival of Russia as a great power in the 21st century. And the major impediment for implementation of this strategy is, of course, underdeveloped Far East for uh, 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 this Russian territory. And if it remains as such as it is, it will become a huge liability and even create security risks for Russia in the future. Thus, a fundamental rethinking of, of Russian strategic thinking is going on. Siberia and the Far East, which historically were regarded as deep periphery, you know, deep rear, the place where political prisoners were uh, sent, uh, including decabrists, who were, uh, which were discussed uh, yesterday, uh, now it is the new frontier. It is the new center of Russia, not periphery, but a center. This requires, of course, preservation and even deepening strategic partnership with China, but also developing a balanced network of relations uh, in the Pacific. This is really becoming a new constant of Russian foreign policy, which is completely independent of the conjuncture of relations with the West. As for the world's attitude to Russia, uh, and I will finish with that, we see a bifurcated picture. And this determines a bifurcated Russian foreign policy strategy. On the one hand, the world really became multipolar and post-West, and non-Western players, they do recognize Russia as legitimate independent great power and equal co-author of international orders. China conducts equal dialogue with Russia despite vivid asymmetry and does not challenge uh, Russian-centric institutions in uh, Eurasia. There is objective demand on Russian engagement among many non-Western players who conduct increasingly independent uh, foreign policy and try to diversify their systems of relations. In a Asia and the Middle East are good examples. In Asia, Russia balances its strategic partnership with China by deepening relations with India, Japan, South Korea, and ASEAN uh, countries. In the Middle East, Russia is already the only global actor which has balanced 
cooperate, cooperative relations with all the regional uh, great powers. So relations with the non-West is for the middle term prospect the major positive dimension of Russian foreign policy and the major proof and consolidation of Russian great power role. As for the West, on the other hand, the West fails to recognize Russia as legitimate global player, as the leader of the post-Soviet space and co-author of the international order, and consequently, we have confrontational relations, and they unfortunately will remain for the, uh, uh, for the middle term prospect. As for the concrete priorities of Russian foreign policy strategy, as a result of this bifurcated picture of Russian uh, foreign policy and, of, and the external environment that I described, I will probably leave that for the second round. Thank you. Grazie al professor Dimitri Suslov, adesso lascio la parola all'analista iraniano Abdul Rasul di Fsallar per l'ultimo intervento di questo nostro primo giro, poi ci saranno proprio un paio di minuti per i vari relatori e le loro conclusioni. First let me uh, thank you uh, our audiences uh, today in this uh, weekend for uh, being with us uh, and spending your weekend with us. Second I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, dear Lucio Caracciolo and his uh, wonderful team for arranging today's event. Uh, the reality is that, um, as we have probably seen in the speech uh, done today, uh, strategy, when we are talking, we are talking about fear and power. Uh, it's quite uh, impressive to understand that when we are talking about a strategy, are we perceiving the strategy as a strategy to dismiss the fear or a strategy to exert power? This is the essential question needs to be answered when we are dealing with uh, country-based strategy thinking. Uh, this is particularly relevant to the Iranian uh, view of its uh, environment. There are at least three major narratives when we are talking about Iranian strategy in the Middle East uh, that uh, they are quite diverse and different. The first one, which is usually uh, put uh, open and usually is picked up by American uh, hardline strategies, is the fact that Iran is a country exerting its power for hegemonic ambitions throughout the Middle East in order to revive the Persian Empire and uh, uh, take back its history. The second, again, with uh, narrative which could be discussed is the fact that Iran is an ideological country, an Islamic ideological country, uh, after post-revolutionary period that is trying to export its uh, political system model outside and uh, through this again take a sort of power. However, there is the third narrative which I think uh, can discuss more, the current strategic thinking uh, uh, in Iran, which is a strategy based on the fear of losing uh, civilizational uh, resources that Iran exerts through the history. It's a strategy based on the fear of existential threat coming from outside. I will explain it more, but uh, before going to, uh, I mean, uh, as uh, Dario Fabio uh, earlier mentioned, you know, talking about uh, strategies absolutely impossible without going back to the history. Uh, Iran maybe is among the few countries in the world that has a, a huge tradition uh, of uh, exerting history uh, throughout history, uh, the strategy. Uh, if you just, I will just give some few major examples which I, uh, I think quite important. Uh, if you just back, flash back to the uh, uh, 530 before Christ, during the Cyrus the Great, uh, you will realize that how Iranians were able to control the satrapies, to control the huge Persian Empire, by respecting different identities that was defeated by Cyrus the Great, giving the autonomy, and at the same time, taking back the military and tax by uh, this sort of uh, federalism that they created. This was one of the first strategic practices that in Iranian uh, civilization you can find. The second example I would like to mention was the fact that how Iranians elites, the political elites and the religious elite, uh, reacted to uh, the invasion of uh, Iran by Arab Muslim countries uh, when uh, Islam was in the period of expansion. Uh, it's quite crucial because these historical tips are, are continuing, uh, 
continuously living in our life in, uh, when we're talking about Iranian strategic thought. Uh, what the Iranians were done was quite impressive in a format that they kept their language, they kept their culture by supporting the political uh, fragments inside the Islamic, at that time, Islamic groups, which were Shiites. So what Iranians were, do, were done actually was putting their own traditions and, 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 and culture and way of uh, thinking into a new part of the opposition groups in Islamic thought at that time, which is now called Shiite. So when you're talking about Shiites, it means it's a mixture of uh, Iranian Islamic tradition, which are major part of it goes back before Sasanid period and when we are talking about Achaemenians, which is still living in Iranian life. This was the second example of how strategic practice uh, implemented in Iran. Uh, the, the third example, which I uh, like to mention here, again, quite important to understand the way that Iranians do strategy, is the fact that how they reacted to the lots of defeats that they were uh, exercised during the contemporary history. Because as you know, Iran lost its um, power during the last two century uh, after the Safavid uh, uh, King Empire, which were in a continuous uh, competition with the Ottoman Empire. And through this losing of power, Iranian in 1813 lost a major part of a South and North Caucasus, which right now are Georgia and Azerbaijan and Dagestan in Russia. The 1813 uh, treaty and later 1828 treaty, which uh, caused the loss of other parts of Turkmenistan, and then later 1857 treaty, which caused the loss of the North part of Afghanistan and later the South part to British, were strategic defeats that caused the Iranian to uh, think about uh, what would be the consequences of not having this proper strategy. So these are three critical moments I would like to start my uh, today's talk about how Iranians look when we're talking about the American strategy, the, the Middle East and their rivalry with Arabs, the Turks and, and, and so on. So bearing in mind these three crucial points, uh, I would like to say that uh, the current Iranian uh, strategic thought is very much the continuation of its history, which is giving quite importance to the security environment. It means that the security environment, in my understanding, is the basic context which is defining strategy in Iran. If you want to read the Iranian uh, strategy mind, you should understand what or how they perceive their security, under security environment. But let me clear this, that actually it's relevant for all the strategic thinkers. When we are talking about the strategy, we are talking about perceptions. <coughs> so we are talking about how strategies see the environment. And here exactly runs the issue of misperception, because when you're trying to read in the other's mind, you may do something wrong, and you may go for the misperception. And here the conflict starts. So the conflict between different uh, strategies, it's the moments that it starts. So that's why it's quite crucial, particularly maybe for uh, our American uh, friends, to understand particularly that how uh, Iranians are perceiving their security environment and how they see their security uh, change over time. Uh, the reality is that what Iranians right now understand is an existential threat to the nation that has been uh, on that particular geography at least 530 before Christ until now. Uh, Iranians, Iranians were able to keep that particular land with a sort of a nation state for 2,500 years. Now that is in danger. The danger is more or less civilizational danger for many minds of Iranians. It's not the economic danger. It's not. Uh, the, the nature of the danger, the nature of the feeling in Tehran is not particularly economic based. So that's why maybe understanding it in the West is a bit problematic because it it's goes very deep into the history. So uh, how this security environment is playing in Iranian strategic mind? The reality is that security environment is the context, is the, is the floor, is the foundation that all thoughts regarding strategy is created. And because right now the security environment 
in the continuation of the history, as, as I mentioned some examples, the Iranians during the last two centuries were losing lands. The last one that we lost was 1970, Bahrain, which a country got its dependence through the force from Iranian uh, uh, Shah regime. So the possibility of losing more land when, for example, you see the, the new uh, Middle East maps, which are sometimes presented by some American think tanks, uh, is the fact that, okay, so there is existential threat. Let's securitize this strategy. So if I would just want to give a single message that how Iranians are thinking about their strategy right now, I can say that the strategy in Iran is securitized. So we have a phenomenon which is called securitization of the strategy. But remember, it's not always the same in the, in the West or in the other parts of the world, because when you were talking about a strategy, we were talking about uh, uh, it could be development strategy, it could be economic strategy, it could be strategy has different perspectives. But at the current moment in Iran, security is the major aspect which is shaping the whole strategy. This is uh, uh, quite significant because it, it, it then defines the national interest. So in this case, what is the national interest for Iranians? I mean, uh, is the national interest for Iranians to, uh, to keep the prosperity of their personal life and uh, uh, the kind of a freedom that is understood outside uh, in the West or, uh, or for example, the, the idea of hijab, which uh, many people from outside see as a big issue in, uh, in, in countries in the East. Uh, it's the difference of perception, as I mentioned before. Uh, the big threat is the threat of uh, losing the land. So the strategy is becoming, the national interest is becoming to create a strategy that can give enough protection to whole national power of Iranians to protect the territory which has been inherited to them through their ancestors. So this is a strategic thought that if you want to understand Iranian way of behaving in the long term, uh, you need to understand that what they do, they may do whatever to keep the territory, and that's the national interest. If, if it's meant uh, in the keeping a political regime, which we all know is not too democratic, uh, well, you can do it through that way. If it means to, to, to support some proxy uh, groups in the region that could create deterrence for, do, for you, so you can do it. Uh, my point is that, of course, the securitization of the strategy is part of the, uh, the Iranian bigger mind, but this context of security, th it has some pillars. I mean, uh, the way that the Iranian thinks is at least depends on, I can say, four major other pillars, which are uh, interacting with each other in this context and creating the final strategy that Iran behaves, which you can see it in the regional uh, military doctrine that Iran adopts these days, which you can see the Iranian military presence in Syria, Iranian military uh, possibly involvement in Yemen or other places around the Middle East, in Lebanon and others, or Iranian missile program. Uh, there are three main, four main aspects. First is the, the history and the lessons coming from the history, the social life, the social change, and also the religion the particularity of a Shiite religion, the political thought of, of Shiite, has a say in defining the strategy. So one pillar is the pillar of the forces coming from history, society, and uh, the actually religion. The next uh, actually pillar is something which I defi define it as, as, as a competing interest between groups. So any country is uh, divided in, in, it, uh, in, the, in the format of its political elites. So even uh, in Italy, you have different groups all over the world. So also this competition between the interests of uh, various political groups is a basic factor that how strategy shapes. So the stakeholders and the players are, are, are one of the aspects of the strategy, which is a, uh, a huge element in defining Iranian strategy uh, thinking. The third, uh, is what exactly uh, another point quite crucial, which is not usually seen in the West, I mean, uh, by Western analysts, is the Iranian understanding of their strategic uh, limits. Usually it's perceived, it's, it's echoed that uh, the, uh, 
current strategic thought in Iran is, uh, is more or less ideological. And when you say ideological, it means that, okay, so there is a God, and we are going to kill ourselves because of the God. And we are going to, to not see the reality of the ground and doing something for the f uh, faith of something else. Uh, this is a, this is a, a completely non-realistic reading of what is going on, at least in Iranian case. The reality is that the Iranian strategic thinking is very well aware of, if, of its strategic limits. For example, the case of Israel is a good, good uh, example. Of course, if you go to the news, you may say, that, oh, come on, Iranian leaders are bringing some rhetorics again, Israelis, they're saying, oh, we're going to destroy you in 25 years, we're going to do that and that. But the reality is that the Iranian move toward the Mediterranean and fix its position in Syria is a reaction to the preemptive uh, doctrine of Israel. So we know that Israel have an atomic bomb. It's the only country in the Middle East that uh, possess atomic bomb. Uh, the Israel have the capability to launch uh, 2,000 sorties of flights per day. Maybe uh, the number could be controversial, but uh, this is the number that is announced by Israeli Air Force. Israeli Air Force is capable, quite capable, to, to defend all major uh, missiles coming from Iran. So in this case, what, what should be the reaction? The reaction is relying on two sources. First source is using of geography, which throughout history, Iranians used it a lot. As you see the map of Iran, it's full of the mountains and the geography plays a lot in the minds of the Iranian military thinkers. So the use of a geography in order to compensate for the lack of a technology is a concept which uh, uh, historically been there am among the military thinkers in Iranians. So using the, cont the geography of Syria in order to keep Israel not attacking to Iran. And the second is the missile program. So when, when your adversary has, a, has a reached to atomic bomb and there is the possibility of uh, uh, nuclear attack, so uh, the only viable uh, reaction could be uh, improving your deterrence. So by, pre by, by saying this, I'm trying to uh, let you know that how these interactions of uh, security environment with the mind of Iranians create the final strategy. Let me summarize it to a few points. That uh, this securitization of a strategy in Iranian case, uh, because um, as uh, the organizers of today want to grab some points for the Italian, uh, finally the Italian way of the strategic thinking, there are some pros and cons on strategic thinking of different countries. For example, in the Iranian case, the securitization of a strategy has led to few good things and few bad things. The good point is that uh, when, you, when you put the basic of your strategy on the ground of a security environment, you're giving a lot of flexibility. The agility, it means that uh, you're agile, you're, you can react much more faster, and you're flexible. And at the same time, you're resilient. If you look at the, uh, how Iranian economy and, and general society has shaped up, uh, it's, it's a very resilient uh, nature in, in reality. Uh, that's why it, it's exactly the, the problem that uh, our Western friends have. They, they cannot understand what is the meaning of resiliency in Iranian. So when they, they, when they put the pressure, it's perceived that by, uh, for example, rising up the pressure, the Iranians are going to act against their political system, which is completely not the case. Uh, so the other, I mean, these good points from the point of uh, securitization of a strategy also accompany with some uh, negative uh, aspects, which are uh, the resource question. So we know in Iran very well that uh, our resources are coerced, the social capital, we're losing some of our social capitals, we're losing our uh, part of our culture because of this rivalry, and we're losing uh, lots of our economic resources at the same time. And then there is the, uh, the issue of uh, long-term planning. When, you're in a, when, you, when you do the securitization of the strategy, this prevents you from long-term planning, which is the Iranian case is a classic term that uh, long-term planning is stopped because of the securitization of, uh, of a strategy. So just to uh, end up my, uh, this first round of uh, note is the fact that uh, perception of a strategy very much depend on the, the analyst's ability, I mean, analysts who are doing the job of the uh, strategic analysis, to understand and perceive and see the security environment. 
how strategies perceive their surrounding security environment is the key element in creating, practicing, and, and understanding the, uh, the strategy. And the problem in the current world order, uh, which I think, the, uh, if we call it American-led world order or whatever, is that Americans are losing the capability to well perceive the security environment, the changing security environment in the world. The Americans are losing the capability to understand well that how dynamics of the security environment around the world is changing. And that's why they cannot react properly. And that's why, for example, in the Middle East, you will see uh, the Middle East is, is now a very chaotic situation, is uh, quite chaotic for countries like Italy is quite, uh, is quite a big issue apart from the fact that politicians are not very much attendant to it, because uh, the next uh, problem in Middle East is something that um, you are going to pay the price for it, the people who are in the South Europe. The problem of migration, the problem of uh, uh, fallout of insecurity to Europe, uh, maybe the next source is Middle East. And that's why uh, it shows how strategy is important, how strategic thinking and understanding the perception of uh, others regarding the strategy could change our life. Thank you. Grazie mille, mi è stato chiesto dai relatori di avere un paio di minuti a testa al massimo per commentare quanto hanno detto gli altri. Cominciamo da Jacob Shapiro, due minuti. Ok, well, I will be brief. Um, First of all, I want to thank my Iranian friend. He is very generous to say that the United States used to have the capability to perceive problems well and that it is losing it. I'm not sure the United States ever had the capability to perceive problems well, and this is one of the fundamental problems of the United States. But thank you very much. It's nice to hear that we were good at it once. Um, the second thing I would just say is um, you also talked about Israel. and. Um, I wouldn't listen to what the Israeli Air Force says. There's no way they can run that many sorties against the Iranians. Um, certainly they want to scare you, and certainly Iran has to fear the rhetoric coming out of Israel, just like Israel has to fear the rhetoric coming out of Iran. But there's a difference between reality and a difference between the real threat. And that just gets to the last thing that I want to say for my part, which is one of the conflicts I have been thinking about a lot recently is the Korean War which really we might call the first U.S.-China war, if we were going to term it appropriately. And the whole, the Korean War basically boils down to one thing. Um, the Chinese and the Russians and the North Koreans did not think the United States was going to intervene to protect South Korea. And they thought that because the United States basically said so. And then when the United States decided that it would intervene, the United States did not perceive properly that China would also intervene if the United States went past a certain point. Now, why am I telling you this, this short story? Because uh, that was a case where you should have been able to see the strategy of all sides. The North Koreans and the Chinese and the Soviets should have all known that the United States was going to intervene in South Korea in 1950, 1951. They didn't. The United States should have known that China was going to intervene if it went past a certain point, if it went past the Yalu River. They didn't. They even ignored all the intelligence they had in front of them to do it. Um, that's why talking about strategy, it is not just theoretical. It is not just abstract. This is the most important panel of the entire weekend because wars happen when we misunderstand what each other fear and when we misunderstand uh, what other countries are trying to achieve. Uh, just the last point that I will make is the thing that is strange about the United States uh, when compared to all other countries in the world right now is that the United States has achieved its grand strategy. The United States is secure. It has no existential fears. I think that may account for some of the reason that the United States uh, is so, uh, let's call it indelicate on the world stage. I think the United States on a certain level doesn't know what it wants to do with itself and feels like it must do something. Um, so yes, I leave you with I hope that our leaders and all of us grapple with these questions because these are the questions that will decide whether our future is more peaceful or more chaotic. Grazie Jacob, anche per aver definito questo il panel più importante del weekend, non posso che esserti grato. Due minuti yeah. anche per il professor Yoji. Okay, thank you chair. Uh, in my first 
session of speech, I basically uh, established the nexus between strategy formulation and the domestic politics. Uh, I will use my remaining few minutes to talk about China's national defense strategy and national, national foreign policy strategy very, very briefly. Uh, the uh, national defense strategy formu formulates or draws the roadmap of Chinese military transformation. The ultimate objective for this military transformation uh, is of two uh, sides. The first one is to reduce the overwhelming U.S. military superiority to one that is relative. Uh, because the Chinese believe, I think Russians too, that the U.S. would not wage an all-out war against another major military power that it does not enjoy overwhelming superiority. Second, uh, the, uh, path, the road path, I think the road, road map for achieving this uh, is to uh, properly set the military doctrines or strategies uh, currently that is in way of formulating a symmetric warfare uh, against the U.S. priority. Uh, now, to be more concrete, uh, the, Chinese are pre the Chinese military is pursuing uh, three MAD, uh, of course nuclear MAD, we have uh, all know that, but the other two MAD, uh, mutually assured uh, disruption is really in the space and in cyberspace. These uh, three MAD were the shortcut for China to uh, deal with mounting U.S. military pressure from a weakness, from a position of weakness, but ultimately, ultimately China would like to increase China would move in the direction to reach a parity, military parity with the United States. Maybe a long way, but China is determined to realize that. The second uh, foreign uh, policy strategy um, is of two sides as well. Uh, the first one I mentioned yesterday that, that is uh, non-confrontational policy towards the United States. That is to say China would swallow whatever the bitter fruits, as long as the U.S. is not determined or U.S. does not really initiate a break, total breakdown. Uh, I think this uh, is a fundamental foreign policy uh, set by Deng Xiaoping and has been inherited and carried out uh, by his, uh, uh, his uh, successors. Then uh, the other side is that China would act very tough and even aggressively against any other countries that would deliberately violate the Chinese core national interests or foreign policy interests that would include Canada, Australia, probably Poland uh, in, in these kind of circumstances. But of, of course, the main mechanism for doing that is basically through economic statecraft rather than naked uh, diplomatic or political pressure. Having said that, I think the uh, economic statecraft could generate the necessary effect that the Chinese trading partners will have to consider because China, after all, is, one, is top trading partner of 139 countries in the world. So uh, this generates a lot of strength for China's economic statecraft. Thank you. Two minutes also for Dimitri Suslov. Thank you very much. First, let me uh, absolutely agree with Jacob uh, about the essential importance of understanding strategy. Because, uh, for instance, if Russian strategy uh, had been understood correctly, uh, such conflicts as the Georgian War of 2008 and the Ukrainian crisis now could have been easily avoided. And Crimea would have still belonged to uh, Ukraine and there would have been peace uh, in Donbass. The same applies for Belarus, for instance, right? I mean, uh, absolutely, if uh, Russia feels that the West encourages the Belarusian integration into the Western structures and the shift in Belarusian foreign policy, we'll have another war in Central Europe. At the same time, at the same time, a, a, a correct understanding of strategy is important for uh, for um, understanding, for instance, that Russia is not going to invade the Baltic states. Uh, and the uh, perception that exists uh, in some parts of the American foreign policy 
uh, elite that Russian uh, strategy is inherently aggressive and after Ukraine, Russia would, you know, invade some uh, even uh, NATO member states is uh, absolutely uh, flawed. And we could, uh, we could end in an unintended conflict as a result of this false uh, perception of uh, strategy. Secondly, I completely understand the Chinese uh, position about non-confrontation with the United States. It's absolutely correct and logical from the Chinese perception. However, from our perspective, China is already in the confrontation with the U.S. because the American policy towards China will be coming even more systemically confrontational. And you see even, you know, some, uh, uh, some one would say awkward but still uh, a deliberate, uh, you know, uh, a, a de 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 deliberate integration of confrontational elements into the American policy towards China, uh, such as the accusations of the Chinese mandling into uh, American elections and so on and so forth. After all, the core uh, disp dispute between the U.S. and China is not about trade balance. Uh, it is about the model of Chinese development, and the Amer which the Americans wants to, want to change, and of course the Chinese won't. Uh, and they are already in the uh, beginning of arms race uh, in the Pacific, and of course the U.S. pull out from the INF Treaty is much more about China than uh, it is about Russia, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, uh, about uh, the outlook of Russian uh, strategy. I think that Russian strategy, foreign policy strategy, will remain bifurcated uh, in the observable future, in the next, I would say, six, maybe up to ten years. And this bifurcation will be the following. We will have a very difficult management of confrontation with the United States and management of more nuanced but still troubles, troublesome relations with the Europeans up until these countries up until these players actually recognize Russia as a legitimate global great power as I described before, which they currently don't want to do this. And at the same time, Russia will pursue a more positive oriented uh, and diversified policies towards the non-West in East Asia, in the Pacific on the one hand and in the Middle East uh, on the other hand. Uh, focused on basically two major objectives. One, development of the Siberian Far East. Uh, this relate, and this requires preservation of uh, partnership with China, even deepening partnership with China. You know, when people talk about that Russia should be afraid of China, that Russia should build a wall or whatever on the Chinese borders, they completely misunderstand that this, this policy dooms Russia for a disaster. This policy would doom Russia for just, you know, a collapse of the state because it would, it would not allow us to develop the Siberia and the Far East. The only way for us to develop Siberia and Far East is through integration into the Pacific, including with China, not through distancing ourselves from, uh, from those players. So we are interested in deepening our relations with China. We are interested in deepening a broader network of partnerships with the East, uh, other East Asian and South Asian countries, India. Um, we are interested in further implementing of the uh, turn to the East and development of the greater Eurasia. And secondly, our relations with Asian countries and with the Middle Eastern countries, which is so far the major success of Russian foreign policy, is crucial for consolidation of the Russian great power role and status. Thank you. Grazie Dimitri, da ultimo due minuti anche per Abdur Rasul Deep Salar. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, yeah. do a very quick flashback to what I said before. Strategy deals with uh, fear or power. It's crucial for us to understand that uh, right now the global order is uh, based on uh, strategy of fear or a strategy of power. Just a quick look at our panel today reveals that uh, Russia feels threatened, China feels threatened, Iran feels threatened, Italy also feels threatened by migrants. Just it's the only case that is not probably feared is our Americans, which I think is not quite unrealistic uh, because they should also be feared. This sends us, send us a very big message 
we were not successful in creating a, a right global order that brings us security as what we wanted. So it seems that we are again in the same position that Hobbesian philosoph political uh, philosophers were talking, the war of everyone with everyone, and the ruling of the fear among us as the strategists. And this is quite dangerous. If you just take a look at the map and uh, see the hot spots around the world, uh, I want to say that unfortunately our problem today is not the poverty, because the poverty is, uh, is uh, the major cause of it is the insecurity. If you just look at the Africa uh, and the round of migrants from Africa and also from Syria and uh, well, uh, in Iraq, uh, even the rise of ISIS, uh, we will see that all roots seem more or less a kind of uh, a security problem that we were not able, I mean, the strategists were not able to solve and good, give good uh, suggestion to their governments. So I think still, unfortunately, the, the biggest challenge that we are in the uh, world facing with is the problem of insecurity that all of us in some sort feel. And it's time that we uh, help our governments and, I mean, we people need to ask our governments to give uh, real solutions, apart from the political ideologies that uh, uh, each are pursuing, to give a right answer that how they want to uh, create a better world in which that uh, all the strategies would be on, based on power, not on the fear. Because when you put the strategy based on the fear, the possibility of aggressive reactions will increase. Thank you. Grazie Abdul Rasul. Ci lasciamo con un brevissimo episodio che vi dà l'idea di quanto poi sia fondamentale la strategia ed anche quanto sia grave il compito di chi se ne occupa perché poi si finisce nell'intimità della propria nazione e delle altre. C'è questo straordinario episodio che si legge in Guerra e Pace di Tolstoi durante la battaglia di Borodino. Siamo nel 1812, a circa 100 km da Mosca, l'esercito napoleonico ha invaso l'impero. Uh, il grande generale e teorico della guerra prussiano Karl von Clausewitz si è arruolato nelle forze armate russe e il, il principe Andrei Bolkonsky che è il protagonista, uno dei principali protagonisti di guerra e pace se lo vede passare davanti e discutere insieme ad un altro ufficiale del che cosa fare e ascolta ovviamente Tolstoi mischia realtà e fantasia ascolta von Clausewitz dire l'altro ufficiale dobbiamo estenderci sul campo, allargare le maglie questo ci renderà più forti. Il principe Bolkonski guarda il suo amico Pierre Bezukov e dice eccolo qui, ha consegnato l'Europa a Napoleone e arriva qui in mezzo alla sofferenza, alla disgrazia, ad insegnarci come stare al mondo. Strateghi, buon proseguimento.